Hey and what is up gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV today. The 2019 Royal Rumble has come to a conclusion and we are finally on the road to WrestleMania 35 and we are here to talk about it right here and right now. My name is Nick Nightmare and you are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's Royal Rumble Review. Let's do it. All right, wrestling fans, thank you so much for joining me. Did anybody else kind of feel like the Royal Rumble was just eh? You know, everybody's like either freaking out or shitting all over it, and there's nobody really in the middle. And I can kind of understand that. But for me, I, I, I'm, I'm one of these guys right in the middle. I love the Royal Rumble. The Royal Rumble pay-per-view is my favorite show of the year. It's a very unique and very special match type, and I very much enjoy it. But I feel like the WWE kind of doesn't take it seriously anymore. Both Royal Rumbles on this night was full of way too much shenanigans. From the Riot Squad and all the crap that they were pulling to three separate people pulling some sort of a fantastic get back into the ring without my feet touching the floor type of thing which was usually reserved for one special spot in the night for the one guy that actually innovated and started that whole thing which was Kofi Kingston who had the least impressive if I'm ask if I'm being honest with you guys and if you ask me I'm not feeling the importance of the Royal Rumble while I'm watching the Royal Rumble. I know as a wrestling fan for 40 years that the Royal Rumble is important, but it didn't come off that way. It doesn't feel that way, and everything sort of was very predictable. There was no big, huge surprise entries that anybody was really excited to see. I'll give credit where credit is due to the Women's Royal Rumble for not actually relying on the Legends path that they did last year, although I did enjoy that. And for the first time ever, that's something that you would expect to see Legends come back and do all their thing. But this year, they focused all of their empty spots on bringing in up-and-coming talent. Ladies from NXT, ladies from NXT UK. And I feel like it took away from the Royal Rumble. Just a little bit. It was special for any of us that are fans of those ladies. I'm not taking anything away from their talent like Rhea Ripley and Casey Catanzaro and all of these young ladies that did a fantastic job in the Royal Rumble last night, but the crowd re reaction was little to none. It made it feel like the Royal Rumble was lacking star power. I can't tell you how many people I've seen on social media many times throughout the Women's Royal Rumble tweeting out a simple one question that would illustrate my point right now, which is, who is this lady? Or who is this chick? Who's this now? Is all I kept seeing people writing. I knew who they were. They came out and they did a great job. Io Shirai. Kyrie Sane. All of the people that we didn't expect to really see. They did good. You look at Kyrie Sane in the ring with a Charlotte Flair. And you're like, damn, I want to see that match. There are a lot of possibilities with all the girls that entries that entered into the Royal Rumble on this night, and, and it was great to see some of these dynamics, but I feel like it was lost on the majority of the live crowd who had a very big effect on this show tonight. And I can't blame them, because this show was kind of all over the place. And it started right off of, in the beginning with the pre-show. The pre-show kicks off... Now, I hate watching the pre-show as it is. And with the runtime being what it was for the Royal Rumble, I don't understand why they don't just start the Royal Rumble at 5 p.m., being that it's a special show, cancel the pre-show altogether, and get everything in and done by 11 p.m. So some of us don't fall asleep during the end of the men's Royal Rumble and have to wake up the next day and re-watch it so that we could come here and do our job for our fans at Sledgehammer TV. Okay, it would be a much more, and a much, an easier show to digest. But the later this show went, the less I really cared, the more tired I became, and next thing I knew, I was waking up on my couch at 3 o'clock in the morning. That's not the way I want to remember the Royal Rumble. Is that the way you want to remember it? Sleeping? I don't. 
partially it's at fault of the WWE and the way they booked that Men's Royal Rumble. It was absolutely terrible. But we're going to get to that in just a minute. The pre-show, as I was getting to, was all over the place. And I knew we were in for a weird night when it started off with a tag team championship match for the Monday Night Raw tag team titles with the glorious Gables. Rude and Gable came out there and faced Scott Dawson and Razor. One member of the Authors of Piss and one member of the Revival. Two teams that WWE don't give two shits about. No explanation. No reasoning. Throwing together a makeshift tag team when there is a list of tag teams in the back that could have easily filled that spot. Not that any of them are deserving or have been built in any proper fashion, but don't you think that's a slap in the face of guys that have been in the tag team division? You could have even... It's a... It's a dual branded show. You could have had somebody from SmackDown Live show up and challenge and lose to the Gables. I don't understand the booking of this match whatsoever. I know Akam is injured and that's why the AOP have not been on TV as of late. But pairing one member of one tag team with another member of a separate tag team to go for the tag team championships with no rhyme or reason for it made me not give two shits about this match and I didn't even watch. But Rude and Gable, the glorious Gables, remain glorious as they are still their Raw Tag Team Champions. Rusev got disrespected two times tonight. Rusev got disrespected by having his championship taken away from him after he's only been the champion for a few weeks, for no reason, again, to give it back to Shinsuke Nakamura, and I'm asking you guys why. I'm asking why they did this. Did they give the United States Championship back to Shinsuke Nakamura so that he don't go looking for employment elsewhere? Did they do this because of how active Rusev and his wife are on social media and how they're very free with their words and say what's really on their mind and sometimes are kind of cryptic, leading to the point that they're not happy? Was this punishment for Rusev? Or is this simply placating Nakamura? Either way, they used the same gimmick they used to get this whole gig started. As Rusev bumps Lana off of the ring, she twists her ankle on the mat, or on the the arena floor, rather, and then Rusev would end up eating a Kinshasa to the back of the head and losing the United States Championship. And, And I didn't really care. I didn't care, I didn't agree with it, and I already knew... The writing was on the wall. Lana was part of the Royal Rumble. Lana should never be part of the Royal Rumble. And this was going to be where we were going to have Becky Lynch come back into the fold. I already knew it right from there. The Cruiserweight title, Fatal 4-Way, was the best thing about the pre-show. It was absolutely breathtaking to see what some of these guys can do. If you guys aren't watching 205 Live, you got to start watching it, man. Buddy Murphy is one of the most talented champions in all of the WWE, and he proved it last night. He took out four of the best cruiserweights in the world, Hideo Itami, Kalisto, and Akira Tozawa, who definitely came to play. There were bodies flying everywhere. I thought I was sitting in an air control tower and that I should have been telling these guys, hey, look out, there are other guys in the way over here. But it was a fantastic matchup. Very on par with all of the type of matches we get at an NXT TakeOver, if you ask me. And I would like to see the 205 Live crew kind of moved more towards that part of the WWE. Go and perform your Cruiserweight title matches in front of a full sale crowd. Or in front of an NXT TakeOver crowd. And watch the difference in the reactions you get. The crowd didn't give a shit. The crowd barely popped at all for this matchup. And these guys really did throw their heart into this match, and it was really, really good, and it was the one enjoyable part of the whole entire pre-show. And now before we get into just going down this card, because there's a lot to talk about with this Royal Rumble, we're going to touch upon the Men's Royal Rumble first, because I just don't understand the way the WWE is booking this thing, and I knew we were in trouble right from the onset. When the Royal Rumble opened with Elias sitting in the ring with his guitar about to do his thing. There was no reason for that. This is the Royal Rumble. If you entered at number one, you should enter at number one. And then number two should follow. And let's get this thing going. Especially since this match almost didn't get started until just about 11 p.m. Don't you think people wanted to go home? Was it really necessary to see him and then have Hall of Famer Jeff Jarrett? Wasting a number two spot, which could have been given to a Seth Rollins and have him go further 
and have a long Royal Rumble matchup, making a historic statement tonight. But no, we got to get Double J coming out, not even looking like himself. I don't know, he looked like a, a weird old man in a cowboy suit, coming out there doing his Double J thing, which nobody really liked Double J Jeff Jarrett when he was in the WWE. It wasn't until much later the people started to come around on Double J when he got Deborah and he was involved with China and he was with the slap nuts and the don't piss me off. That like That's the Jeff Jarrett people want to rem- remember. Not the electric cowboy. This was awful. And it did nothing to the Royal Rumble. Oh, but it was fun. It's entertainment, Mr. Nightmare. Yeah, we have time for all of that, but not in the Royal Rumble. It's getting ridiculous. I understand nostalgia, I understand the need for some levity here and there, but this is kicking off the Royal Rumble. This is the road to WrestleMania, and you got a retired Hall of Famer in Jeff Jarrett in there going after a shot at the main event at WrestleMania to fight the Beast Brock Lesnar or Daniel Bryan? You want me to give a shit about that? You want me to think you are taking that seriously? It wrapped up quicker than I anticipated, which was good. As Jeff Jarrett found himself on the outside of the ring before you even knew it. And then we would get Shinsuke Nakamura coming in here at number three. Shinsuke Nakamura. The guy that just won the United States Championship. Now, is that the caveat here? Is that why he was in it and Rusev was not? As Rusev is again disrespected by not being allowed to take part in this year's Royal Rumble after having lost the North, uh, the <laughs> United States Championship to Shinsuke Nakamura. And why does Shinsuke get to be in it? Is that it? Is it because if you're a champion, you get to be in it? We've seen almost every champion that the WWE has on this night. And that would make the most sense. It's like, well, if you're a champion and you're not the world champion, you could be in the Royal Rumble for a shot at the champion. I guess I can't get too mad about it, but why was Rusev not in this thing? Absolutely ridiculous. But then you get Hall of Famer Kurt Angle, another Hall of Famer, another guy that hasn't been around for a while. It doesn't need to be in this Royal Rumble. Would you give it for a cheap pop so the crowd could chant, you suck? It was a waste of time. It was a wasted spot. Kurt Angle was not going to win the Royal Rumble. It's just not what's going to happen. You wouldn't have believed it. I wouldn't have believed it. Then finally, we get somebody good coming out in Big E. And I thought, all right, finally, Big E, somebody who's going to do some damage in this Royal Rumble, somebody who's going to take some shit seriously. I gave them credit. You know how hard I am on the New Day for being the comedy section, but I figured Big E was going to come in here, you know, serious-minded and goal-oriented and, and try to get that spot for the New Day. That was not the case. This guy came out with pancakes in his fucking trunks, all right, stuffing them in people's mouths, and then before you know it, he would be eliminated. Unbelievable. I thought he was going to be one of the guys to get at least, like, four or five eliminations on this night. Big E is a big, powerful dude, and this is why I get annoyed with the New Day, because a guy like Big E is just stuck in this role that he is so much better than. The guy should be in world championship contention, and he's not. He's a joke. He's a pancake-making joke. And I don't like that, especially in my Royal Rumble. Then we get the biggest, one of the big shockers of the night... Johnny Gargano, at number seven, uh, six, comes out. The North American champion just won it previously. Does this mean that had he lost last night, we would have seen Ricochet in the Royal Rumble on this night? I don't understand, because they've never done anything like this before. And I'm not shitting on Johnny Gargano being allowed to be in the Royal Rumble, but you should have at least let this guy have some time to shine. Pulling off a couple of moves here and there is, is nothing. Johnny Gargano is a primetime talent. He's one of the best things about NXT, and he should have went a lot longer than he did in this matchup. He left almost no impression after he got out there, and everybody was, oh, oh, we're excited, it's Johnny Gargano. And like He was just like lost in the sea of bodies that were out there, and it, it didn't make much sense to me to have him in here. Honestly, when you have so many other people that are not on this list, I don't get it. Why you would bring up Johnny Gargano to be in here, but we didn't see a Lars Sullivan, who's been being hyped for Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live and should have made his debut in this Royal Rumble and didn't. We didn't see EC3. That was a name I thought for sure was going to end up making his debut in the Royal Rumble matchup. Neither one of the two members of Heavy Machinery 
all of these people that you are telling us we're getting, who are pretty much not even debuted yet, and then you you keep them out of the Royal Rumble? I don't understand it. But you give us Johnny Gargano, and you give us Pete Dunne, and you give us Nia Jax. We'll get to that in a minute. Having Jinder Mahal in this thing? Wasted spot. Samoa Joe, Mr. I'm so serious, I'm going to come out there and win the Royal Rumble, came out there and didn't really do much of anything. Kurt Hawkins was in this thing, but why not Zack Ryder? That's where they were going with Kurt Hawkins. What the hell point did he make for being out here to be the guy to come out here and do what Zelina Vega did in the Women's Royal Rumble and hide underneath the ring? So that Titus O'Neil would have a reason to go underneath the ring? Uh, um, is this what I'm ta- um, This is what I saw. I mean, was I dreaming? You guys can let me know because this is fucking bullshit. This is the Royal Rumble. This is the kind of crap we're getting. Seth Rollins came out at the big number 10 spot. I was hyped to see it. I thought maybe finally this Royal Rumble was going to start to really take a much more serious tone. And it kind of did. But then we got Titus O'Neil at number 11 coming out and doing that whole shit with Kurt Hawkins. I don't even give a shit. Mustafa Ali came out at number... I'm sorry, Kofi Kingston came out at number 12. Mustafa Ali came out at number 13. Dean Ambrose would come out at... Number 14, No Way Jose comes out to enter the Royal Rumble with all of his dancing conga morons. That's how seriously this guy takes the Royal Rumble. And the WWE thought this was great. Yeah, go ahead. We'll have No Way Jose go out there and and dance around the ring instead of getting there and get his mind right and and, and going for the WWE Championship or the Universal Championship. No, I'm going to come and fucking dance around like a jerk. I hate it. It's something that irks me when they do it on a weekly basis. And no way, Jose, why is he even in this thing? When was the last time you've even seen him on TV? But but again, no Lars Sullivan. Or, you know, no anybody who anybody gives a shit about. No way, Jose has lost all his luster. Nobody gives a shit about him. Drew McIntyre, right in the middle of the Royal Rumble at at number 16. I thought... He was going to be a much bigger player than he was as well. Nobody was truly booked to look that dominant. He had a couple of big-time eliminations as Xavier Woods would follow him at number 17, finding Kofi Kingston on his back outside. And that's just ridiculous to me. Like, I get the both feet have to touch the floor because of the whole Shawn Michaels scenario, but the man's entire body was on the floor. Just because your feet don't touch the floor, that means you're not out. Come on now. let it. I understand it. But that's taking advantage of the rule, I think. And it, it just makes for more of this outside-the-ring nonsense, which is all everybody gets in the Royal Rumble and then half of them are laying outside the ring. They get thrown through the second and middle ropes now and, and just hard to keep track of. And it's not that enjoyable anymore. You don't know who's still in it. Because this one's hiding under the ring. This one's laying out there by the announce tables. That one's in the corner over there. And everybody else is fighting. And you're like, who the hell's even still in this thing? What the hell is going on? That's how I felt during the whole Men's Royal Rumble. But Drew McIntyre, like I said, would end up eliminating both Xavier Woods and Kofi Kingston after they do some weird, you know, Cirque du Soleil type of human duo. I don't even know what to call it. It was... Just ridiculous and took time away from the Royal Rumble for Xavier Woods and Kofi Kingston to end up being eliminated anyway. So all that effort was for nothing and it was stupid. WWE Champion from the UK, Pete Dunne, made his Royal Rumble debut and didn't really do much of anything. Andrade Cien Almas was in the Royal Rumble this year. Good for him. At least he got in there. Apollo Crews came out. He was in there. That was fine. Alistair Black being in the Royal Rumble. I don't necessarily have a problem with it, but as I pointed out to you guys before, with all of the talent that is already not on this card, and I don't truly believe they have a clear plan for Alistair Black coming up to the main roster and to do anything with him, I would just leave him alone and make sure he stays in NXT just a little bit longer, maybe bring him up on the Raw after Mania, when WrestleMania comes to a close and start the whole new wrestling year. 
at that time of year, that would be a better time to bring him up. Having him get his feet wet in the Royal Rumble, it's fine. He came out, he was Aleister Black. He was very impressive, and it was great to see him have a dynamic with some of these other people in the ring. I wanted to see him and Drew McIntyre start to go at it. There was great potential for him in this matchup, but none of that potential was realized. The way this match was booked was very boring. I wanted to see him versus Seth Rollins a lot more in this matchup. Like, have people pair off and give us some stuff. But everybody was just all over the place. Going from one guy to the next guy, nothing really made sense. They were trying to set up feuds in the future in the Royal Rumble, which is fine, which is something you do. But there was just way too much overbooked nonsense for me to really pay attention or care about what was going on. Even refreshed and awoken in the morning like this is retarded to me and I did not enjoy majority of this Royal Rumble after Alistair Black Shelton Benjamin another guy missing in action for months we never see this guy on TV no reason for him to be in the Royal Rumble but here he is in the Royal Rumble came out looking good though Had nice attire you know looks the part Shelton Benjamin is like a million bucks man but why is he here when was the last match he had what gives him any reason to believe he's going to win the Royal Rumble? We haven't seen anything from Shelton Benjamin since he's truly returned. They've done nothing, and he's just another talent that they have failed with since his return to the WWE. Baron Corbin, do we even have to talk about Constable Corbin, dickhead? Do we even have to mention that he came out in the Royal Rumble dressed up like a fucking waiter again? Do we have to mention that he was part of this thing? Yes, we have to mention it because it was an actuality, and it did actually happened, and Baron Corbin was in the Royal Rumble. Thankfully, the only thing that matters is that he didn't win the Royal Rumble. Everything else he did in the ring, who the hell cares? Jeff Hardy at number 24, followed by Rey Mysterio at number 25. The Intercontinental Champion, the all-milk dud, Boring Trashley, comes out at number 26, and he is another one who was very quickly eliminated. Not that I really care, because I didn't want to see him go on and win this thing to begin with, but this is the Intercontinental Champion, and he was made to look like a fool, which he usually does on his own by bending over and showing everybody his ass, and whenever he has Leo Rush next to him talking a bunch of shit, he looks like a fool anyway. But this, to me, I, I would have at least fought against this. I'm like, bro, I just won the Intercontinental Champion, and you want me to go in and out of the Royal Rumble? Chump me out for this other guy? Why? Why? Stupid. Not that I'm on his side at all, but I just thought, wow, they really don't give a shit about the Intercontinental Champion. It, it just is not important to them. It has no prestige. Yeah, just get him out of here. He has nothing to do with what's going to go on. Right? Terrible. Bobby Lashley kicked off the final five entries of the Royal Rumble, which would go as follows. We Like we said, Bobby Lashley, Braun Strowman, Dolph Ziggler, Randy Orton. I'm I'm already asleep. I'm already asleep and I could I can't imagine why with the amount of star talent that is in this matchup right now. And then number 30 made this match go to high hell. Our truth comes out, he's singing his what's up? What's up? And you could have given me a million and one names that were going to come out there and scoop this guy up. And take his spot for the Royal Rumble. Not one of those names would have been Nia Jax. And now forgive me. If this sounds a little sexist. But I bring the hammer down. And I bring it down with truth. And I am going to sit here and tell you guys. Wasn't the reason. That we created. A women's Royal Rumble. So that shit like this. Stopped happening. In the men's Royal Rumble. I understand the involvement of the ladies like China and Beth Phoenix and Awesome Kong, all respectively. But at that time, there was no women's Royal Rumble. And if you want to get on my balls, oh, well, it's a big deal. She's a big girl. You know, it was historic. It was this, it was that. What would you be saying if Braun Strowman decided to enter the women's Royal Rumble at number 30? That's okay. We were worried about our truth being the guy to try to show up and be in the women's Royal Rumble. And instead we get Nia Jax in the men's Royal Rumble after she just lost in her own Royal Rumble where you couldn't beat 29 of the quasi-best female wrestlers in the world 
Now you're going in there with the boys? Why, so you could take an RKO and everybody can talk about, oh, look at what Nia Jax did. Becky Lynch won the Royal Rumble on this night, and we ended the night with one of the top stories being Nia Jax entering the Men's Royal Rumble, which was just fucking stupid. If the girls can just be in the Men's Royal Rumble, then why are we having a Women's Royal Rumble? Do you understand where I'm coming from? Once upon a time, this move would have made sense. Now, it does not. Having her in there, especially at the coveted number 30 spot, and then go out there to do what? Pull off a few impressive moves, get RKO'd and eliminated by a bunch of guys. And everybody on the announce team like didn't even know what to do. They were freaking out. And Corey Graves is like, is this okay? Should this be happening? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, you're supposed to tell me, guy. That's your job. You're the commentator. You're supposed to know the rules. You're supposed to know what's going on. You're supposed to relay that information to me. You're not supposed to be sitting there like a dumbass asking the world, oh, hey, what's going on here? Same thing to Renee Young all night long. Oh, what is the... Is, is this how it's supposed to be? You tell me. You tell me. You work for the company that's putting this shit out for us to watch. You tell me. I shouldn't have to tell you guys anything. If you were doing your job at least half as good as you should be doing it, none of us would be sitting here on YouTube complaining about anything. Well, that's probably not true. Because there's always something to complain about, right? But you get the point I'm trying to make. And all of this leading up to a very underwhelming Final Four being Braun Strowman, Seth Rollins, and Dolph Ziggler... And Andrade Cien Amas, with your winner eventually being Seth Rollins. And while I don't have a problem with that, I wanted Seth Rollins to win this thing. I just didn't like how the Royal Rumble was booked. Very underwhelming. And I love the Royal Rumble. And this Royal Rumble literally put my ass to sleep. So there you go. There's my gauge on the men's Royal Rumble. On the women's side of things... It wasn't so bad. It, I mean, last year's was better, in my opinion. But a lot of people are coming down on this in, an, in a negative way. And I think I'm probably just going to be another one of them. Only because it, it suffers from the same thing that the Men's Royal Rumble suffers from. There was just way too much. Way too much little things being involved, and maybe one too many surprises. We had one, two, three, four, five, six, six surprise entrants on this night, not including Becky Lynch. All of them coming from NXT, with the exception of Maria Kanellis, who, if I never see again, will be too soon in a WWE ring. What was the point of having her in this matchup? Why, was it just to placate the masses and show everybody that she is indeed not looking to get out of her contract. Right? Was it to put something out there like, oh, stop talking about her leaving the company because look, now she's in the Royal Rumble. She hasn't wrestled since she's come to the WWE at all. She's been pregnant. She's popped out a baby. She's been doing rehab for her husband and, and, and now she's in the Royal Rumble just out of nowhere and we're supposed to give a shit. And then what does she bring to the table? She wants to fight with Alicia Fox over a fucking hat. No thanks. This is the Royal Rumble. This is a shot at the Women's Championship. And you're fighting over a hat. And Alicia Fox can try as hard as she wants to be relevant. She is the most irrelevant, the most ear-scratching, most eye-gouging, most just vomit-inducing talent that I have ever seen in my life. Why this girl is employed, I will never, ever understand. Even sexual favors should not be enough to keep somebody this terrible around if, in fact, that is what she's doing to keep her job. Because there's no, 
What other reason can you guys give me for her being around? What does she bring to the Royal Rumble? What does she bring to Monday Night Raw? Bad acting, terrible selling, and a lackluster wrestling ability. Something that somebody who has been in the business for over a decade should be able to do. Especially if that's what you claim to be. This is a relic from the Divas age that needs to go away. Because she just is awful. And Maria Kanellis did nothing to help that. And her being involved with Alicia Fox just makes her just as much go away as Alicia is to me. This Royal Rumble started off with the lady Lacey Evans making her in-ring main roster debut at the Royal Rumble in the Royal Rumble matchup. At least we've seen her on main roster television. And she told everybody she was going to be there. So not much of a surprise. Number two was Natalia. Natalia would go the almost a uh, almost the distance, but she would be eliminated much much later in this matchup. Mandy Rose coming out in this thing at number three. Liv Morgan at number four. Mickey James at number five. Ember Moon came out at number six and had the best Royal Rumble maybe of anybody on the entire roster, lasting 53 minutes and 10 seconds in this thing before it was said and done. Billy Kay comes out at number 7, and I just wanted to shoot myself. She's walking around the ring, screaming she's not getting in there, she's not going to do this, blah, blah, blah. And then finally, the countdown clock kicks in, and we get Nikki Cross. Nikki Cross comes out, gets all crazy, throws... Uh, Billy Kay into the ring, hits the top rope, takes everybody out with a big suicide body splash, and that was the highlight of Nikki Cross's night. Nikki Cross did not get one elimination. The Queen of Chaos did not eliminate anybody in the Royal Rumble. She was just in there to be a body, and that is absolutely ridiculous. Peyton Royce of the Iconics would come out at number nine and try to even the score for things with Billy Kay. Tamina. Another one who has no reason to be in this matchup other than her family connections. And I just don't understand how they can look at this girl and not see how terrible she is. Her timing is awful. Absolutely ridiculous. And she was allowed to eliminate people in this Royal Rumble. Tamina was made to look better than Nikki Cross. Let that sink in for a minute because it didn't... It took a while for me to realize, wow... Tamina's getting all this attention. She's beating up everybody and she's throwing people out. Why? Why? And then Nikki Cross gets nothing. After Tamina, here's where I I bring up my point where I don't think most of the crowd knows who Zia Lee is. Zia Lee has wrestled in the Mae Young Classic twice. She has not really had much of a presence on NXT television. Nobody knew who she was, except for people maybe like you and certainly like me who would covered the Mae Young Classic from start to finish. And I know the talent she possesses, the first young woman from China, not Japan, bringing a completely different style of professional wrestling. And she gets one spot. She gets one spot to shine. And it was ruined. By Tamina and her ridiculous timing. She she threw a kick to Tamina. Tamina catch caught, rather, her foot. She was supposed to do the flip over, land on your feet gimmick that a lot of people do. Doesn't seem to be that hard. But there was a timing issue. It's almost like they tried to do it twice and they didn't get it right and then Tamina didn't throw the leg or something because this girl ended up falling and it did not look great. And she had her moment ruined by being paired with somebody who should not have been in the Royal Rumble in the first place. So I felt bad for Zia Lee in that moment. Sarah Logan came out at number 12. Charlotte Flair came out at number 13. And then again, I thought, well, now things will probably start picking up and being serious. And then, surprise, number 14, Kyrie Sane. And we had a standoff in the middle of this Royal Rumble between the Queen Charlotte Flair and the Pirate Princess Kyrie Sane. And I got goosebumps, man. That's what the Royal Rumble is about. Moments like that. 
How could your blood not start get pumping when you saw those two just standing face to face? And then they started chopping at each other and started getting at each other. And there was this great dynamic in the ring between these two awesome superstars. And then the countdown clock would kick in and we would get at number 6, 15, Maria Kanellis. Immediately deflating the Royal Rumble of any seriousness and any awesomeness that was just about to happen because we had to cut away to watch her come walking down the ring and blow kisses to everybody in her little red riding hood furry fucking he- stupid sweatsuit or whatever the hell it is and it took away from everything that was going on in the ring and then when she hit the ring she has to have her stupid spot with Alicia Fox which will be coming up in just a couple of minutes. Naomi comes out Naomi comes out at number 16. She gets to do the Kofi Kingston spot in her matchup, which has become a thing since last year, I guess. She did it last year. She was going to do it again. And she went through all this trouble and pulled off a great balancing act to get back into the ring after she was almost eliminated at one point during this Royal Rumble, only for Mandy Rose to push her off the steps. Mandy Rose, who should have been away from ringside already, (laughs) was still there. By the time Naomi was around the way, pushed her off and cost her her spot in the Royal Rumble. Which I understand. They're building the story. They're telling a story. And I'm not so upset about anything that happened between those two. It's just a little bit underwhelming to me. And very predictable, if if I'm being honest with you guys. What wasn't predictable is seeing Candice LeRae in this thing. I don't understand why she was here, but I loved it. I loved seeing her come out, and I loved seeing her in the ring, and she was very impressive in her little amount of time she was given to shine in the Women's Royal Rumble. And once again, just as I start to get my excitement level back up after a person like Candice LeRae comes out, we get Alicia Fox at number 18, and I just want to shoot myself in the head. We get that whole stupid hat segment with her and Maria Kanellis, and I feel like the clock just wouldn't get to 90 seconds fast enough to interrupt everything that was going on between these two. I have a problem with this guy that's in charge of the clock, and I call shenanigans on him because I don't think that it was a real-time 90 seconds per entry in either Royal Rumble, and I think that they stretch and shrink that time interval because nobody's sitting there counting seconds in between. Nobody's going to call them on their bullshit. So they probably got away with it because I would have done anything for anybody to come out. I was hoping somebody from the audience would jump the rails just to stop this segment from happening. You got people in the ring like Kyrie Sane, Charlotte Flair, you know, and you got these two idiots fighting over a hat. No. No. At least things start to pick back up again because at number 19, a big surprise and very happy for me to see Candice, I'm sorry, uh, Casey Catanzaro. Casey Catanzaro, the American Ninja Warrior who stole my heart in the Mae Young Classic last year. She's been doing some incredible things in the ring. And I think that when you see how she got back into the ring during the Women's Royal Rumble, that you can understand what I'm saying. She's another one that landed outside, but her feet didn't touch the floor. She did a handstand and walked back on her hands to the ring post, wrapped her ring, wrapped her legs around the ring post like Spider-Man, and then flipped up and climbed back in the ring, only to be unceremoniously disposed of by one Rhea Ripley after all of that in the end, later on in the matchup. But Casey, Casey Catanzaro, definitely impressive entry into the Royal Rumble. After that, I kind of lost track of her, and I didn't see what was going on until she had her little segment with Rhea, who will be coming out in just a couple of spots. Zelina Vega came out dressed up like Vega from Street Fighter. And it was great. I love that she does these little theme outfits, and she's the only one, I think, that really understands what being a star is all about, because everybody else just comes out dressed the same in the same old outfit. But when there's a big show or something big going down, she comes out dressed in something cool, and this was definitely cool to see. She went right into the ring and picked up where she left off with Candice LeRae, and we revisited Andrade Cien Almas and Johnny Gargano for just a minute through their respective females, and it was fantastic to see them get fired up and get going. But then it would get ridiculous. Zelina Vega would find herself on the outside of the ring and would crawl underneath the ring and then would stay there for the majority of of her time in the Royal Rumble after that little awesome exchange with Candice LeRae to kick things off. Ruby Riot comes out at the number 21 spot and she comes out flanked by the Riot Squad who were already entered and exited this matchup very, very quickly 
prior to her coming out. And now I started to get pissed off. Because they're just pulling girls out and they're interrupting this whole entire festivities of the Women's Royal Rumble. For what? It accomplishes nothing. You didn't give Ruby any sort of decided advantage. Ruby still had to get in there and beat people up. You just decided to be riotous outside the ring and cause a distraction and a disruption to the Royal Rumble. For what reason? These girls came out there already tonight. They weren't able to do anything to anybody. Literally, in Liv Morgan's case, she walked in the ring and was thrown out of the ring. She didn't do shit to anybody, but now all of a sudden, she's pulling people out and kicking ass. Same thing for Sarah Logan as well. Did absolutely nothing in the Royal Rumble. She gets thrown out. She goes to the back. She comes out with the boss, with her boss, Ruby Riot, and now she's able to do some damage. This just took away from everything that was going on in the Royal Rumble. Didn't make it feel like a Royal Rumble to me because shit like this don't happen. Dana Brooke, number 22. Do I even have to go on? The final surprise of the night prior to Becky Lynch's involvement would be Io Shirai. Io Shirai, who did a moonsault to the Riot Squad and everybody else that was on the outside in this unnecessary moment, only being there to set up for this move. Io Shirai goes up and hits her beautiful moonsault and takes out everybody on the outside, trying to save Kyrie Sane from an attacking riot squad on the outside and was successful in doing that. She gets back into the ring. And again, nobody really reacted to Io Shirai in the live crowd. I did. I'm sure you did. A lot of you guys know. You, I know many of my fans were excited to see her in there. But what did it do? What did she do? One impressive spot, and then she was just another body in the ring. Next thing you know, she was gone. Before he even knew it. Rhea Ripley, former NXT UK Women's Champion. Number 24, Rhea Ripley. So now if you want to add my logic to the Men's Royal Rumble about all the champions being in the Royal Rumble, they didn't do that here, because the champion is Tony Storm. This was a former champion in Rhea Ripley. Tony Storm not in the Royal Rumble. Rhea Ripley, for some reason is in the Royal Rumble. I didn't really have too much of a problem with it. Like I said, she hit the ring and had a nice spot with Casey Catanzaro picking up where they left off from the Mae Young Classic, and it was great to see. I was getting into it, and then Sonya Deville would come out at number 25, and I'm like, oh, right, she's employed too, because I forgot all about her. Alexa Bliss made her big return at number 26, and she got the biggest reaction of the night, and I don't really know why. I love me some Alexa Bliss, just like any one of you guys out there. She's an absolutely beautiful girl, and she's fantastic to look at, but we haven't seen her wrestle since September, and if that's the reason why you were looking forward to seeing her, then maybe you can cheer. But other than that, what good does Alexa Bliss really bring to a wrestling match lately? Not much. So I wasn't looking to her to save this Royal Rumble, because at this point it was not going to be saved in my eyes but she was mildly impressive doing some cool flippy thing landing on the knees and and it was okay bailey came out at number 27 lana came out at number 28 even with her little leg injury and she took way too much time she stood out there through the entirety of of the rest of the Royal Rumble as Nia Jax would come walking past her and not give two shits about her. And then the number 30 spot, which we all knew was going to go to Carmella, she would also walk past her. Lana's staying outside the ring this whole time until finally Becky Lynch comes out, makes her pleas to Fit Finley to let her be the one to take the spot. Bop, bop, bop. And the rest is history. Now, that being said, everybody made it in the Royal Rumble that we expected to be in the Royal Rumble. Becky Lynch losing the championship match earlier in this night, which we will touch upon in a second, freed her to be in the Royal Rumble, and we all got our wish, as Becky Lynch would go on to win this Royal Rumble matchup. My problem with it being, again, the just the over-dramatized booking, and why, after Becky Lynch seemingly got some sort of a measure of revenge on Nia Jax, you still had to allow Nia Jax to do something to maintain this feud? Like, what was the point of Nia Jax pushing Becky Lynch off of the steps? Because she was mad. She was mad that she got eliminated, and let's talk about that for a second. Becky Lynch had her face broken by this lady, and she should have definitively 
and very, very excitingly, if that's a word, eliminated Nia Jax. Not sit there on the outside and wait for Nia and pull her feet off of it. She should have clotheslined that big broad right over the top rope. Giving her some real satisfaction and some real vengeance. But no, it was very underwhelming. That's what we're going to call this show. Because I've said that word maybe about six times. It was the underwhelming rumble. It wasn't a bad show. Just felt a little bit off. And I can blame it only on the booking and things like that. That now Becky Lynch had an injured knee for the end of the match. You needed to add more drama. You needed to give people more reason to think maybe Becky's not going to win in this scenario. I am happy they did not do the 1994 Royal Rumble rehash that all of the smart guys have been talking about. Oh, well, that would be the best. And you could have Charlotte and Becky in the Royal Rumble and they'll eliminate each other like Brett and Lex did and blah, blah, blah. But no, this is Becky Lynch's moment. I fully expect Charlotte Flair to find and be added into, find a way and be added into the championship matchup. And it'll probably end up being a triple threat no matter what. But in this moment, I think it was very important to let Becky Lynch be the man. Give her this win at the second Women's Royal Rumble. And I don't mind that at all. In fact, that's exactly what I wanted to see. And now she can have her pick of either having a rematch against Asuka, which I really don't think she gives two shits about. Or she can pick up where she left off with Rowdy Ronda Rousey. And that's where I think... We are all headed as this road to WrestleMania begins. Let's talk about Ronda Rousey. Her match with Sasha Banks was something I was not expecting. Now, I don't want to say that as a negative connotation. That was a very... It it exceeded my expectations greatly, and it is a credit to Sasha Banks. Here's somebody that you might want to say, Oh, well, she don't really even wrestle anymore. She hasn't had a great match in some time. Every match Sasha Banks has is a great match. Because she's a great wrestler. And she brings out the best in the other person that's in the ring with her. Just because you might not care for it or whatever, that's your opinion. You're entitled to it. But Sasha Banks tonight carried Ronda Rousey through the best match that she has had since coming to the WWE. It was exciting. It was wrestling. Lots of submission maneuvers. Lots of countering. Lots of power from Ronda Rousey. She definitely allowed Sasha Banks to look like she was a viable competitor. Nobody was not going to believe Sasha Banks had a chance by the end of that thing. And it was a great match. It was a great match between these girls. And I want to tip my hat to them. They really went out there and and way performed beyond anything I expected that they would be able to do. And then the drama at the end after Ronda Rousey would end up getting the victory here on Sasha Banks, they would have a moment where they were, it seemed as if Ronda was trying to end this thing with some manner of mutual respect. But Sasha Banks was like, no. Flashed the four horsemen symbol and just turned her back and walked away. Very, very cool moment for both of these ladies. And I think we're just starting here with this, and I, I'm hoping that they do it correctly. I know a lot of you guys aren't looking forward to the four horsewomen angle because they don't have faith in the WWE to write it correctly, and I don't have any faith in that either, believe me. But I'd rather them at least try than have all of the pieces in play and not even give it a shot because sometimes we, the fans, take over and make the segment, right? And we can also have the power to break a segment which is definitely what happened to poor Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles. These guys went out there and wrestled their asses off. This was a great match. It maybe wasn't better than the matches that they had already, which I kind of thought was going to happen. But being placed in the death slot following a Royal Rumble, you could have had any two superstars anywhere in that ring and nobody would have made a peep. Everybody was too busy being on their phones, showing their pictures to the world, posting out on Instagram, I'm at the Royal Rumble and Becky just won. I'm at the Royal Rumble and Becky just won here and there and everywhere. Instead of paying attention to what was maybe the best wrestling match on the whole entire show. This match was great. But what I didn't like about this match was the way it ended. Now again, this is almost a 50-50 thing. I liked it, but I... 
but I'm a little bit wary about where it's going to lead as Eric Rowan, of all people, would show up dressed up like a gigantic version of Daniel Bryan and get Daniel Bryan the win in this matchup, keeping AJ Styles down with a face palm choke slam type of maneuver, allowing Daniel Bryan to get the win and retain the WWE Heavyweight Championship. Is this leading? Obviously it is. But that's the question everybody's asking is, is this leading to some sort of a faction for Daniel Bryan? And I say, why the hell not? Oh, what, are they going to bring in Luke Harper and it'll be like a new Wyatt family? No, it's not going to be a new Wyatt family. It's going to be Daniel Bryan's vegan vengeance squad. Or <laughs> whatever they're going to call it. And if you bring Luke Harper back in and they're all, they used to look good together when Daniel Bryan, to me, was part of the Wyatt uh, family. The problem being Daniel Bryan shouldn't be playing second fiddle to Bray Wyatt, Daniel Bryan being the bigger of the two stars. But if he's going to assemble a squad, a straight-edge society of sorts to protect the planet Earth, I'm loving it already. And it didn't even happen yet. I don't like the fact that it was brought out or that this debuted during a WWE Championship match at the Royal Rumble. I think AJ Styles deserves a little bit more respect than that. But uh, intriguing and interesting. Not too much to bring the hammer down on too heavy because at least as this is done, we have many more questions and many more reasons to tune into SmackDown Live to just find out what the hell happened there and why Eric Rowan is siding with the new Daniel Bryan, but I think I just told you guys why, and I like I would like to see that come to fruition, and I hope they don't ruin it with bad additions to this stable, but we'll have to take it one week at a time, and we will be here to let you know what's going on, as we always do. Shane McMahon and Miz won the Tag Team Championships, and Shane McMahon did a shooting star press, a 49-year-old shooting star press, and that's all we're going to say about that match. That's it. We're going to move on. Because I, I cannot sit here and analyze this or give you guys my opinion on a moment that I am considering the death of the tag team division. When you put this whole thing together, only for it to come to an end tonight, with them on top and The Miz... Taking pictures with his dad. And the story of the Miz's father has never been quite proud of him before. How sad. How sad. This man was in the main event of WrestleMania. Beat John Cena. His dad wasn't proud. No, this guy's a multiple time tag team champion with guys like John Morrison many other guys like our truth we had the awesome truth he's been part of many tag teams all of which were viable and many of which had gold none of that made you proud pop huh your boy was the intercontinental champion one of the better intercontinental champions we've had in recent memory you want proud of that no no but you're proud of him being best friends with Shane McMahon. And you're proud of him winning, winning these championships now. And I'm supposed to give a fuck. Because Mike the Miz's dad is the ringside crying for his boy. He's finally fucking proud. Finally proud. Your son is a former world champion. Finally proud. He's got more money in his back pocket right now than I probably will ever see in my lifetime between his USA Network show and all of his movies and all of his wrestling and his merch and... You're not proud of him? Next. The finish of Asuka versus Becky Lynch is the only thing I really need to bring to you guys, uh, bring out to you guys and make a point of because this match was really, really good. These girls were brutal. They were sadistic in the way that they were hitting each other. They definitely came to fight. It was a very well-crafted story. However, the finish did not tickle me 
in the right way. And that sounds perverted, but that's not the way I meant it. Becky Lynch should not have tapped out. Especially if she was going to be made to go on into the Royal Rumble and into the main event of WrestleMania. You're worrying about making Asuka look weak. If Asuka's getting the win, no matter how she gets the win, she doesn't look weak. Asuka comes out on top. If you want to preserve how Becky Lynch is going to come out of this thing looking, you want to keep her looking as good as possible, tapping out to that Asuka lock, even though she executed it in a bridge, which was a very unique and different way to do it, in under like five seconds, like she didn't even try. You didn't even try. You're this badass female. You are the man, right? Everybody's comparing you to Stone Cold Steve Austin. Everybody's talking about how tough and rough you are. And you tapped out so quickly to that. And if that's in fact how it was scripted, that was a terrible move. She should have been made to pass out. She's so tough and she's so strong and she would not give up. And that could have been one of the reasons you gave Fit Finley if he had to justify, well, why did you let Becky Lynch get in the rings? Well, she never gave up. She never gave up in her championship match. And she should be rewarded for that at the very least. She didn't win the title, but she never gave up. She didn't lose it either. But now tonight, Becky Lynch straight up lost. Now, this might be a victim of NXT TakeOver because we've seen that happen with Bianca Belair. But th- even so, there are other ways you could have went about doing this. You could have had Oscar win by disqualification. You could have had some other way to go about it to make Becky Lynch not actually have to lose and then still find a way to weasel her way into the Royal Rumble later on for the women like you did. But that's not what happened here, and we got what we got, and it is what it is, and Becky Lynch tapped out pretty damn quickly to that very unique version of the Oscar lock after putting up a hell of a fight. And I know she found herself wrapped in the Oscar lock four or five times prior to getting into that final combination where she ended up tapping out, but still, you kind of chinked the armor of the last kicker a little bit, and then... All right, fine, she goes out and she wins the Royal Rumble, but how much more special would it have felt if she didn't actually tap out at the beginning of the show? Just throwing it out there. Although I don't have too much of a problem with the way it all ended up, and Becky Lynch has the Royal Rumble win anyway. And the final thing we are going to talk about is Finn Balor versus Brock Lesnar, which, as I told you guys, it was going to be, was fucking great. But it was way, way too short. This match was cut short, and even if it was just for time constraints, I could appreciate that, being, like I said, we were going up towards the 11 o'clock hour, and I don't know how this show ran over and got so out of control from the producers. But even if this was the amount of time allotted for this matchup, it was not enough time for this matchup. Finn Balor looked fantastic. I was not happy that he didn't come out as the demon, but we have to forgive that. We already kind of knew that was not in the plans and that they might be holding it for a big thing at WrestleMania. And now that it has come and gone, we all know that that is the case. And the demon didn't come to fight the beast, but Finn Balor definitely did. And he took advantage of one key spot in this matchup where they found themselves on the outside and he would shove Brock Lesnar twice into the corner of the announce tables right in the midsection, right underneath the gut, and that shit had to hurt. And it definitely hurt Brock Lesnar in a big way, allowing Finn Balor to really take advantage of the situation and come so close on multiple occasions to actually winning this matchup, even going as far as to executing a picture-perfect coup de gras that made Paul Heyman cream in his pants because he was so scared. But the Beast, after enduring that coup de gras, would wrap up Finn Balor in a Kimura lock, the same lock that broke the arms of guys like Triple H in the past and Goldberg and all these people that have suffered under the Kimura lock and tapped out with the quickness. Finn Balor needed to follow suit. This was a great match. It was probably my favorite match of the night. And the Royal Rumbles were not my favorite by any stretch of the imagination. I guess it could have been worse, but it definitely, definitely 
could have been done much better. The road to WrestleMania begins with Seth Rollins having his choice of Daniel Bryan or Brock Lesnar and Becky Lynch having her choice between Asuka and Ronda Rousey. And now, in a few hours, we have to get ready to be tortured by Monday Night Raw and let's see what they're going to do with all of this as they set the stage for WrestleMania 35. Speaking of stage, I enjoyed the presentation of tonight's stage. I liked the dugout entrances. I thought it was great. It was kind of like a throwback to Royal Rumbles of the past when we didn't always have these big overbearing stage sets to take away half the crowd from the, from the arena to begin with. And I enjoyed it. So if you were just wondering what my feelings were on that, I've seen a lot of people going, oh, I don't like the new set. Why didn't they use the original set? Well, why does everything have to be the same? Right? Why can't we do different things to make things feel different? I wish they would have used that much creativity or foresight to do something differently as far as booking these Royal Rumbles. Because while the winners are fine, I felt for the most part that both of these Royal Rumbles were very, very boring. And that might just be me. And if you don't agree, you're free to do so. And you can do so in the comment section down below. Make sure you hit me up down there. Let me know what you guys thought about the Royal Rumble. I apologize for such a late showing. But like I show told you guys, I fell asleep. I had to wake up this morning, watch the show again. But now we are here this afternoon to talk about the Royal Rumble. Leading us into tonight's Monday Night Raw after the Rumble. Which hopefully doesn't put me to sleep as well. Thank you guys for checking me out today. Once again, make sure you hit that like button if you enjoyed today's show in any way. Let's sure make sure you let me know by hitting that thumbs up down below. Share this video with each and one of your wrestling buddies all over the wrestling world, especially if they enjoyed themselves watching the Royal Rumble. And as always, if you are not subscribed to the newest fastest rising podcast in all of the YouTube wrestling community, the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, all you got to do is subscribe right now. Don't forget to do so. Hit that subscribe button and join the Sledgehammer TV family today. Become one of my 1208 at this moment. Brothers and sisters in a family that is respectful and knowledgeable and likes to have fun when talking about their most favorite thing, which is professional wrestling. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is my team, Thor the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, and his tag team partner, the World Heavyweight Champion of all the microphones in all the world, Mr. Blue the Snowball, the most important member of the team, as always, is you guys. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much for being with us on a very, very busy Royal Rumble weekend. And the rumbling don't stop as we got Monday and Tuesday to cover. And we will be here to do so with you guys as always. That, my friends, is going to do it. And we are out of here. And we will see you next time right here on your new favorite wrestling show, the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV. We'll